afternoon and today on JCT's Fascinating Hobbies we're going to be taking a look at this. This is the ITT VR3984. Now if you know your JVC clones you'll know that this is a clone of the JVC HR7655. Uh, um, it has a similar button layout to the Ferguson 3V3132 series hence these these buttons on the front but visually and also these timer buttons and these channel buttons but visually it's very very different and seems to sort of have a very strong uh, sort of 1980s high-tech aesthetic which uh, I really like to be honest with you now I bought this machine some time back and um, I've never actually tested it so today I'm going to be powering it on and seeing exactly what it does so it came with these instructions which are rather nice it's a uh, very rare I actually get a machine with um, the original instructions so to actually have um, a set of the original instructions is is quite special really and certainly uh, certainly quite nice to have including this rather nice fold out structure of this manual affair um, the original ITT control I don't have, but if I check my box of various controls, which I'm just wading through now, I have a rather tired looking Ferguson version. My god, that is tired actually. <laughs> Looks like that's really been used hard. Um, I've actually got a much better condition, Ferguson branded one upstairs. But um, all of the controls, uh, be it the JVC, Nordmend, Akai, ITT, Saba, uh, Ferguson, and, and the Ferguson clone, rental clone versions, were all um, sort of form branded versions. All the remote controls were the same, and they certainly are compatible with each other, so that's a bonus. I'm actually just checking my other box of controls to see if I do have any other controls that may work, which I don't. I've got this one, which is a Nordmend uh, V500 SpectraVision control, and that's for the deck that uh, came before this one. So we'll be looking at the V500 on another day. But the manual is fairly comprehensive, to be honest with you. It gives you everything that you need to know. And um, as you can see, the control was actually a nice, looking at this, it was a nice black or very dark grey colour. So, so quite different to the standard ITT, uh, sorry, so the standard JVC versions, which were usually a silver colour. Also gives you um, connection details. You can connect it straight to a TV receiver via the aerial cable, or you could go uh, via a amplifier to get the full stereo sound if you didn't have at the time a stereo TV. Um, obviously other bits of information like tuning it in, uh, doing other bits and bobs with it, pushing the cassette in there and you know all of the sort of things that you would standard sort of expect from a manual of this era including the all-important programming guide for using that timer. Uh, the sleep timer facility, which was, um, uh, I don't know how often that feature was used actually, but that was an interesting feature you got on these decks. There was also, because it's um, one of the earlier VHS decks, it had loads of editing facilities. So you had twin 45mm, uh, or are they 3.5? I can't remember. The larger. There we are, the larger phono connectors that you've got, the larger phono jack connectors that you've got for the microphones. You've also got a headphone connector as well. Uh, may not be able to see it completely with this picture as it's a little bit dark. I'll just move that, might get a bit more light. Uh, but you do have a number of um, facilities on this machine, such as separate tracking controls for the low speed and also the X2 and standard speed tracking. Uh, slow motion control so you can adjust the speed of the slow motion. You've also got an audio in input, either radio or TV. There's an insert button so you can insert, I think, um, individual frames or bits of video, which is, you know, another sort of edit deck function. 
There's the all important audio dub, which should basically dub order dub over the audio track. Um, also got this L and S switch. Now the, the lesser version of this, and certainly the um, other versions, such as this Ferguson unit up here, which is 3V31, only have one switch. And the second switch is for long play and standard play. Now this does boast at having four heads. Now, unlike more modern VHS decks, which ha would have four heads, all of the heads would be used for uh, replay and recording. Um, on this particular machine, you've got two heads, which are for standard play, and you've got another two heads, which are for long play. And the long play heads, if I remember rightly, are ever so slightly thinner than the um, standard play heads. So you could actually sort of record uh, the information on the tracks onto the tape closer together, um, because obviously the tape speed is slower. So let's see what this machine will do. It's been in storage for quite some time, in dry storage, I hasten to add. So let's plug it in. So it's plugged in. And we flip the switch. So we have no clock, interestingly, but it's in standby. So let's flick it to the on position. If we look inside, the video lamp still seems to be active, which is good. So that's one of the first things that tends to blow on these is the video lamp, because it is literally just a small bulb and um, a lot of the more modern VHS machines actually make use of a light emitting diode. So we've got the long play switch, standard play switch, that's important for recording. We appear to have no clock, which is, I'll be honest with you, not unusual for something of this age. I'm not going to uh, be particularly upset about it. Um, something I will probably need to do is to take a look at that module and actually see, a bit like the Sony Betamax machines of this era, see if there is a battery that's leaked acid everywhere. And if there is, do the relevant uh, cleanups. I do have, uh, thinking about it, downstairs somewhere, a complete spare clock and channel module. So certainly one of the things that I will be doing is replacing uh, that particular module. But the first thing we want to do is to actually make sure it actually works. So stick a tape in it and see what it does. So let's go and find a suitable VHS cassette. So back with the machine, I have a suitable VHS cassette. So let's plop it in and see what she does. Try that again. So instantly we can see there is a problem with the loading facility. And these particular decks use a rather elaborate chain driven uh, loading cradle, which is rather impressive if you look at it. So let's get the cover off which is four screws on the top, four normal size screws, as the Betamax covers actually go right the way through the machine, um, the screws rather go right the way through the machine on the early models like the C5, C7, and make up um, a certain amount of the structure of the machine itself. So, we've got the cover off, you can have a good look in the inside of the machine and the first thing that um, I can observe is this is really tidy inside there is absolutely no dust anywhere so you can see there that little chain facility so 
I just need a little bit of uh, manipulation to get it down. So let's hit play and see what happens. So we've got fast forwards. Where's the stop button? And it rewinds. It's always a good sign, it's a good start. Well, I'm not sure if you can see this under here, but if you look at the video head, you can see our four heads. So you've got the head drum itself, and then you've got the four individual heads around the perimeter of the drum. So let's hit play again. So tape laces, helpfully. But we don't seem to have any playback unless it's not fully lacing, but it is retracting okay, so that's already a good sign. It's already looking very viable. So let's try and hit play again. See if we can do a shuttle search, which we can't, so it's not lacing fully. So let's take off this top cover. So this is a bit of RF shielding. So we'll get this off and we'll have a look to see what's going on with the lacing on the machine. So carefully and gently take it off. Now you can really see those four heads on the drum. So you've got two heads for long play, two heads for standard. So let's hit play again. It does seem to go fully. Do we have capstan rotation? And that whole assembly does look very dry in there, so I may need to plop some grease onto that. Everything else is looking fairly good. Right, let's get the bottom off and have a look. So after some fun and games, removing the uh, the bottom panel, you have to unplug each of these wiring connectors. Uh, we're now inside the underneath of the machine. Now, immediately, we can tell what the problem is because Look at this capstan drive belt. It is, well, it's stretched beyond all recognition. So what we're going to do is we are going to see if I have a replacement drive belt in my collection of parts. Oh, that's fallen off completely now. Yeah, that really is not, um, not taut enough. You can also feel that the belt is very, uh, so sort of dry and not brittle, but it's very dry and it's um, it's past its best. This here uh, drives, I believe, the um, uh, the posts which bring the tape up to the head. So it actually drives the um, the loading uh, tape loading mechanism for the uh, the actual tape itself, not the um, the tape shell. This is the base of the head, and you've got one, two, three, actually is that just one, two, hang on a minute, it's one there, one here, so that's, yeah, it's just got one each. Which would make sense because that's basically tells you the position of the head drum uh, with this little sensor here, 
which uh, gives the circuitry an idea of the speed, servo circuitry an idea of the speed of the um, the head is spinning at. So obviously you can sort of make sure it's spinning at the correct speed. Still got a number of solenoids in these later machines, and uh, they're for sort of various deck functions like pause, etc. And um, What's rather nice about these particular decks is you've got this little board here where a lot of the individual um, individual functions of the deck actually come together. I think this one, 29.9, might be the video lamp, although the video lamp is actually usually two blue cables, so I think... Is it this one? No, because the video lamp plugs into one of these individual boards can usually tell because the vid I think that's the video lamp wire here and the video lamp wire goes where is it going uh, I'm not sure actually it's been a while since I've um, sort of dived in and serviced one of these so yeah that's a bit of a mystery it's not important now though because we don't need a video lamp. You can see um, certainly from the first generation or well I say second generation, first generation of electronic control um, a lot of the component count has gone down especially if you look at the C7 Betamax I mean this machine wasn't in competition with the C7 as it was effectively the um, next generation of machine so you could class this as a third generation VHS machine so, let's go and have a look for a belt. Incidentally, this one would have been up against the pretty excellent Sony C9 Betamax, which was a third generation beta machine with uh, linear stereo and a very trick deck mechanism. Uh, a lot of direct drive components on it. Um, to a lesser extent, this would have been up against the F SLF1, which was a very high-end uh, beta machine for the day. Uh, I've got an example upstairs. It was sort of more a portable machine, uh, but still very high end for what it was. So let's go and have a look in my collection and see if we've got a capstan drive belt. So good fortune would have it that um, I overpurchased uh, some time back a complete service kit for the um, 3V31. And um, I've got downstairs, I've got an idler assembly, which I don't think I need on this one. I've also got a pinch roller, but I've also got these belts. And what's quite nice about this is we've got the um, measurements for the belts as well. So I'm going to keep this bag once we've, uh, you know, once we've replenished these belts and um, replace these belts rather. And I'll be able in the future to order uh, the individual items um, without having to worry about measuring up the belts and seeing exactly what size we need. So let's um, swap my prop up screwdriver. Into there. And first off we need to remove this bracket here, which is basically holding the capstan itself in place. And there's a couple of screws holding that in place. Okay. So that's those out the way. Uh, as you can see, that is now free to move. So, what we're going to do is get this belt. First off, move this out of the way and remove this little belt. So, little belt there. Capstan drive belt. Off you come. Out the way. Capstan drive belt is here. You can see that that is past its best. Now there are tricks apparently where you can microwave these in water for about 15 minutes and that's something I'm going to read up on and actually try but if you look at this it's going 
don't know if you can see that properly on the camera. Ah, oh, there we go. It's a light. You can see that that's really beginning to perish. In fact, uh, it snaps now, so that's fit for the bin. But that does give you an idea of uh, sort of how past it it actually was. So let's have a look at the fresh belt that we've got. Now I'm not sure if they've. Um, if I, ooh, what's this? Oh, that's good. Oh, oh, amazing! One, two, three, four, five. I have got five individual capstan drive belts for uh, this particular series of machine and funny enough I've got one two three four five of this particular series of machines so <laughs> we've got enough to be going on with that's good anyway let's get this in here so the belt goes underneath the bracketry uh, there she goes. whoa Oops. Stupid bloody thing collapsed like a proper up again. There she goes. Right. Go around the flywheel itself. Loop onto the motor. And if we unsnag it, just feed it around like so. Hopefully, we should actually get it to catch on. It isn't doing at the moment. Always a bit fiddly getting these in, as they just sort of slide under the flywheel itself. So let's try that again. Let's round onto the flywheel, onto the motor, and gently does it. Round you go. Oh, let's tuck it under again. Always a real pain. It's because you've got limited access, so it takes a few attempts to actually get it in place. Where are you? There you go. Right, so onto there. Hold it in place. Round. Keep it taut. Hook it on. Gently spin it round, keeping it taut again, and drop down, spin it a bit further, and that should, if I push that down onto the motor itself, underneath the top lip of the motor, that should actually spin down and settle on the flywheel, which it's now doing. There you go, so that's settled quite nicely. Um, I th I got a replacement for this little belt. I don't, but that one's not too bad. So I'm going to put that one back as it was. To, to do that, we need to. I might actually start it on the other side of the pulley. So there other side of the pulley, keep it taut and around and there you go. Now the next step is to refit that little bit there and also just put one of these back into the little bag because we've got a very useful selection of these now which is uh, an unexpected bonus that I was not expecting hence it being an unexpected bonus. There we go, into the bag. And round we go with again with camera. And let's find the correct bolts, screws, and down we go. There's one. So I'll try and keep that as central as possible. Because it's actually um it's actually got a little centering thing in the middle. So Let's get that one in there. Not fully tight because I want a bit of movement. A little bit of play. Get the second screw. And the second screw is going to go into this one. Have to go in at a slight angle. Whoa. Let's 
Try that again. Magnetic screwdrivers are real of a real godsend in this particular scenario. So there we go. Let's make sure that's as straight as possible. Yeah, is that gonna latch in? annoying. What a pain. Let's try that again. in Let's nip this one down there we go all right so that's nipped in it's all in the wires are all secure uh, let's put a little bit of grease on that worm gear for the uh, deck loading facility itself so I don't want too much usually tend to use about that amount and a little bit onto there and then just work it like so using a dry finger work the pulley and work it back again in fact in fairness the machine's going to be doing that itself so we don't need to worry too much about that So let's have a look and see if there is anything else that we need to attack whilst we're in here. So we've replaced our capstan drive belt, far tauter than the other one. Uh, we've greased up this little pulley here. Uh, all of these reed switches I don't really want to touch because they're horrible. Uh, these solenoids are all okay, it's all very clean under here. There's nothing else that really needs greasing apart from that worm gear. Um, what I'm going to do now is to pause the video and you're going to see the machine again once we go topside. So you rejoin me with the machine currently upside down and I want to show you the reason why. So keep an eye on the motor in the corner there. So let's just prop up the top circuit board which this time round is a lot easier to actually move out the way. Anyway, so if we hit play, that goes to load the tape. Motor is still spinning. I need to go a little bit further to get the tape to fully load. So now the tape is playing healthily. If we go to stop, motor is spinning again. Give the little wheel a move and the tape unlaces. So what I'm going to try to do is replacing that individual belt. As I think I've got possibly a suitable loading belt here. So let's plop that in and see if that makes a difference. Because that may be another issue with the machine. Uh, pinch roller seems to be okay because the tape is actually moving and um, seems to be doing everything that it needs to do so let's hold this up and let's pop off this belt which is easier said than done because it's um well that's a bit of a pickle that's actually sort of into there quite heavily so i'm trying to remember how i actually did this last time see these little clips here Think I've got to remove those and then that will allow the central um, almost sort of like an axle to move out of the way. First off let's check this sizes relative to each other. I think they're about the same so I'm 
I might do as well is give that a bit of a clean up. So let's get that replaced. So I've just replaced the loading drive belt and if we hit play machine laces completely and fully and playback ensues if we hit stop machine unlaces healthily right let's get this reassembled um, incidentally there are So there's a pivot mechanism like you find on the Sony C5 and C7. Um, number of wires underneath, which uh, first time round I did this, they needed to be disconnected. Second time round, they're up perfectly fine. Um, I think the problem was this one here, this connector, was snagged underneath this um, little uh, locating lug here. Um, so as soon as that's out of the way, you can actually lift that out of the way, which is how it's intended. So you can actually service the machine um, and you can make adjustments um, to these sort of potentiometers if you need to. These were set at the factory. Um, they may have been serviced since, but generally I don't really want to touch them ever. So the lid obviously just goes down like so, the circuit board. And slips into place like so and then you've got um, this little sort of earthing tag here which goes into that one there you've got a screw in here 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 and here and then it's on with the bottom cover which locates under these uh, lugs at the back Sorry, there. And goes into these clips. And then that's that. So, let's power off the machine, make sure it's unplugged, and get it reassembled. Something else that's surprisingly easy to do with these machines is to actually remove the entire, um, the entire loading cradle. You can see that sort of rather elaborate chain mechanism there. It almost looks like a cam chain. Uh, that you would sort of typically find in a car. Um, this particular loading belt here is a little bit uh, a little bit loose. So what we're going to do is just spend a bit of time replacing that in a second. Um, one thing I've done is I've just applied a little bit of grease to the um, the loading mechanism as well. Um, really, just to sort of keep everything. Uh, ship shape and in order there and hopefully that will uh, run its way around as the machine laces and unlaces um, obviously just sort of giving the machine uh, giving those sort of particular components a bit of a lube up um, this cable here is for the actual uh, loading um, mechanism itself so it just powers the motor so what we're going to do is I'm just going to pause the video again because what I'm going to have to do with this, by the looks of it, is pop off these little circlips or somehow possibly I might be able to free the motor off um, to actually sort of get in there uh, so I can actually just get this belt off. So that's going to be interesting. Final thing I'll do is I'll probably just apply a little bit of grease uh, to that worm gear and uh, we'll see where we are then. I've got a suitable belt hopefully which is here so hopefully that will fit. Yep that's certainly with a little bit of a stretch that certainly looks like it's going to fit and uh, yeah we shall see where we are once that's done. I'm just going to demonstrate this a second. Now what I did was I removed the little circlip here which sits here on the uh, the worm gear so it sits about here and what that has allowed me to do is to basically just push this rod through and ever so slightly pull the worm gear out of the way leaving, whoa, leaving me with enough space to get the belt in and the belt is now sat there 
waiting to be looped around this pulley and the motor and then once that's done we'll push this back through replace the circlip and we should be hopefully ready to refit this into the machine uh, pending a cleanup of the pulley with some video head cleaner and something else I did actually on the um, loading pulley was I just applied a little bit of sandpaper into the pulley and ran the pulley round, just roughing up the inside of the pulley itself. Are there any more times I can? How many more times can I say pulley in this sentence? And what that does is it just allows the belt to have something to grip onto, uh, just makes things a little bit uh, grippier, so to speak. Um, I think some people also use hairspray, which has sort of got quite a tacky. Um, Sort of nature to it so it does sort of allow um, belts to sort of stick to uh, pulleys a little bit better anyway let's get this reassembled put it back in the machine let's see where we are after that right we've got the machine reassembled let's see if it takes the tape a little bit better oh it takes it and then it immediately ejects it let's try that again Eject it. I want you to take it and enjoy potentially using the tape and playing it back. All right, let's try this again. Well, at least it ejects the tape now. That's always a good sign. just now by holding it in place. No, that upset it a bit holding it, so let's turn it off. Hmm, okay, that's quite odd. So there must be something else causing it to do that. So you turn that. That effectively starts the loading. So let's try that again. So you push it against there. That causes it to load the cassette. Interesting. I wonder if that needed resetting after the work I've done to it. So if I hit play, laces healthily, starts to play back, uh, fast forward search, seems to be doing that correctly, rewind search, seems to be doing that okay. That's the beginning of the tape. For some reason it just froze it out. Go on back in. Alright, let's try this again. will be something that I'll need to do a bit of investigation into. Someone just wondering if um, that's out of sync for some reason. See it's accepted the tape now. So I wonder if there's a dodgy sensor on there uh, that may not be triggering correctly. But that's something we will look at on another day. 
Uh, I think what I'm going to do now, I'll leave the tape in there, reassemble the machine, and then we'll actually test out the um, VCR itself and play back and see what it's like. So there we go, I've just muted the audio so that we don't get a uh, content uh, hit. Um, obviously the flicker is because I'm not using a camera that I can actually change any of the, uh, the relevance of the timing on. So I'm just going to see if I can get it to a particular angle where we can actually see the picture slightly better. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're using the Faithful Pi and we're just making sure that playback works effectively. So we've got um, the machine is currently running as you can see with the tape run light blinking away. For some reason noise reduction is on and noise reduction is that switch there. Uh, we're playing back fine so what we're going to do is we're just going to try some of the trick functions. The first one is times two speed and it's not actually that bad. If I see if I can adjust out the noise on the screen, you can get it to a point where you can sort of adjust those noise bars. Incidentally, the noise along the top is a problem with this um, this particular venerable pie, and something I need to look into at some point. But you can get a very good times two playback. Now, unlike the earlier 3V23, if I put the sound up, we don't have any uh, double speed sound. Uh, that was something that was particular to the 3V23 and required a complicated bucket brigade circuitry setup in order to achieve the, uh, the effects that it did. So if we just go back to play again. Where's the sound gone? Let's put the volume up. Oh, hang on. Look over your old assembly and shoot shout. Come on, Del boy. Get off home to bed. Go into times two mode again. And back into play. Let's mute it. Now, some of the trick functions. We have pause. That's actually gone into slow motion. Or has it? No, it hasn't. So, slow motion is this one here. So, you can actually go very slow. gradually faster and fastest I'll just go back to middle and go back to pause We've also got a frame advance button so you can advance a frame at a time and for slow motion We've got a slow motion tracking control, which I'll be honest doesn't really seem to do very much, but the facility is there. Anyway, let's hit play again. And that's off playing quite happily. So fast forward search. Working well. The rewind search might be a bit sluggish. Ah, actually it's working well. Check the sound. It really is. It's all quiet. Yeah. Working very well indeed. So the only thing that's not working, which seems to be a running theme with my uh, various VCRs, is the clock and obviously these LEDs. Um, there's no actual battery on the back of the clock board, which is something I checked earlier. Um, so I just I wonder if the problem is very likely somewhere else. I mean, flicking the tuner camera switch doesn't yield anything. And pressing 
the dimmer control and all of these other buttons does not yield anything either so I would say that uh, it's either the board itself or the supply to the board um, is knackered but to be perfectly honest with you it's not really um, it's more of an aesthetic thing these days than anything that sort of really concerns me the rest of the machine is working well as you can see well, if we didn't have the noise bars we are getting a superb picture obviously superb for a VHS machine more than watchable and obviously all of the trick functions work as well so there we go certainly uh, a little bit more successful than yesterday's project but uh, you know nice little uh, sort of foray into uh, a machine that I've had certainly for a very long time and haven't actually done anything with and it's actually quite good to be able to finally do something with it anyway if you have found this video interesting and useful please don't forget to hit that like button and also consider subscribing for more upcoming fascinating hobbies thank you very much for watching